We move on to the next topic, which is financial dimensions of international pricing. Now, before we go to this topic, I just want to answer one good question that was asked uh, in the break. Now, please ask me questions in the in the class, right, rather than in the break, because my answer then can benefit the whole class. But a question I just had was, is there a link between reliability and esteem? Often you may think that a more esteem or more prestigious uh, product is also going to be more reliable and going to be able to be uh, having a longer life. Not all the time. Yes, the perception may be there, but the reality may be quite different. The Mercedes-Benz, in terms of faults per hundred, that is the cars, new cars that are returned for a fault within six months, 17 faults per hundred. Pretty bad. My wife has had now over two Mercedes, both cases within three months of the fault. Okay, so my, my case is 100%. Okay, now Toyota is point, uh, 1.7 falls per hundred. And you know for the last two years what has won the JD Power ranking for at least the most quality car in the US? Not even Toyota, is high in that. Okay, so the, in terms of reliability, that is the most reliable car. But our perception is because it has a cheap price, good things no cheap, cheap things no good. So it is a big problem that companies like Hyundai and even Toyota face. Toyota, of course, had to rebrand with the Lexus to show how good they were. Okay, so these are things. Now, I can tell you that if you purely look at reliability and other features, in four years' time, we will not be talking about BMW and Mercedes. We will be talking about Hyundai and Kia. Have you seen the latest Kia? Okay, it's got German engineering. Okay, and the quality control in that Kia is up now of European standards. <coughs> but we don't think of a Kia as a prestige car. Okay, so if they do things, get their brand right. By the way, the Americans are quite different to most of the rest of the world. They are willing to give these new cars a chance. And they are very, very popular in those countries. Okay, so the answer to that question. Now let's go on to taking the pricing decision away to the international dimension. So in doing this topic, we are going to cover two NBA areas, international business and international finance. Okay, so essentially, when we cross a border and we want to sell in another country, we are going to come up with a unique international dimension. Two of them are important for the pricing decision. Then the thing of the channels of distribution, that is more people are going to be handling your product. Okay. And this would mean that you're going to pay people some money to handle your product, such as uh, importers, wholesalers, and so on. Plus the fact that that would be a, a GST or a turnover tax, there is price escalation. The second one is the multiple currencies. If you are not in a world currency like the euro or the US dollar, you are most likely be working in another currency, and that could be subject to adverse exchange rate fluctuations. Okay, so these are two things we're going to look at. Now, the market for the firm today is the world, especially after the opening up of China and India and Eastern Europe. Okay, these days. We have a huge population to work with. However, international markets are different from local markets because they, when one crosses the international frontier, one encounters so many different things. One is company and commercial law. Okay, so you see that I mentioned already that most company law and commercial law comes from British company and commercial law and variants of that. But this is the Sharia law, we had enough of a discussion on that earlier, so let's not talk about that. But you can see that that has a totally different dimension when you go overseas. Okay, so that would be this. Now, when companies have gone to China, they've encountered places where not even British company law is there. No one understands the law in China. The 
study for what you think is a normal business practice, you are put in jail and so on. So you've got to be careful about that. Then there is tax regulations. Okay, from very high taxation countries, someone asked me how much I tax do I pay in Australia? It's about 38 percent. 38 percent of my salary goes as tax. Right? To pay no taxes at all, to very low tax uh, areas like Hong Kong and Singapore. So you have this tax regime. Also, of course, the some some countries there is no tax on foreign earnings. Others have you have to pay tax on international earnings. But if you pay tax elsewhere, and if there is no double taxation agreements, you pay tax twice. So there are so many <coughs> issues in tax regulations. Culture. This is a big one. Okay? Even today with the CNN world, and the fact that all of us are sort of understanding each other's cultures and you can most often look the same the way we dress. You go to a little child in East Outer Mongolia, you will be wearing the same New York jeans as a child in New York. Okay, they, they may look the same, of course cultures are very different. And these cultures can stem from religious aspects to uh, education levels and so on and also the food that you eat. Okay, the food that you eat they say that no matter how, what part of the world you go, you basically want to eat the food that you have grown up with. Okay, so there are different cultures. And I'll show you some issues about cultures in a little while. Customs. Okay? What are acceptable customs in one country may be not acceptable in another country. And con complete shock is in other countries. For example, I don't know if this is true or not, but it was reported in the United States that a girl had gone out in Saudi Arabia with a man and she was raped by other men. Right? She got, in, she got into trouble because she was out with a man who was not her husband or her relative. Now when this news item comes in the US, they say, oh, shocking, shocking, terrible people, terrible people. But in the United States, the very place that they were talking about this was Richmond, Virginia, where in the hillbilly countries, brother and sister get married. So when that is shown to the Saudi Arabia, they will say, oh my God, terrible, terrible, terrible. So you can see different customs are different in different places. Now interestingly for the men over here, would be Iceland. Okay, if you go to, uh, actually more like the Greenland, if you go and you get stuck in the snow and you go to Eskimos in blue, with the custom, for the Eskimo is to offer his wife for you for the night. That's the custom. But before you go running to Greenland, please note that if he comes to your house, you will offer the same thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so be careful, right? Before you go running. So customs are different, and I mean, I'll show you some interesting differences in custom. And these can be for simple things, you know, like uh, saying hello or how what you do to uh, head movements, you know the Indians and the Sri Lankans, they do like this all the time, you don't have to do this or no, they are shaking their head up and down, okay? So these are sorts of the customs that you will encounter that sometimes are confusing. Wants, what do we want? Purchase in okay. These can be very different, but money earns in one country or can buy in one country, it's quite different to another country. Now in, in, uh, in uh, The Economist magazine, for the last, maybe even the last 15 years, has been putting out a thing called the Mac McDonald's Index. So they are taking the McDonald's in the USA, where they say the McDonald's product is very, very simple. It's bread which you can make in a local country, the meat and so on. They're <coughs> looking at the price of McDonald's in US dollars and then comparing the McDonald's prices around the world, and looking at the percentage up or down, and then comparing that percentage difference with the exchange rate differences, and they are able to predict the movement of your currency is going to be depreciating or appreciating based on the price of McDonald's. And there is now serious academic research studies on the McDonald's index because it appears to easily beat all the bank forecasts and predictions that are actuaries for exchange rate movements. We're going to have a look at the McDonald's index. That's an interesting index on purchasing powers. Influencers, who influences you? 
Often these influences can be religious influences, like we read in the situation in Iran and so on. It could be film stars, like in India, or sportsmen in India, who have much more influence than the politicians. It could be um, other people like you know, uh, famous scientists and so on in other countries, politicians. Now in the USA, except for maybe the last two years where this person has retired, who was the most influential person in the USA for the last, for about 10 years? Does anyone know? Who? Maybe Michael Jackson. Not Michael Jackson. He was not that influential. Okay. Bill Gates. Bill Gates, no. You think so, Warren Buffett? No. Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey was the most influential person in the USA. She's the one who endorsed Obama and got the election. She just has to look at a book and it says a million copies. Right? So here is a black woman being the most influential person in the United States for 10 years until she uh, stopped the television program. So you can see these influences can be different from country to country. Languages, that's an interesting one. Languages. Okay, so what sounds okay in one language may be a problem in another. For example, the Swedish company Electrolux came to the USA. Electrolux is a vacuum cleaner company. And it simply directly translated its slogan from Swedish to English. Okay? And the slogan was, nothing sucks like an Electrolux. Okay, now those who know the English language, those who know the English know something that sucks is a terrible product. Okay? They were talking about the sucking action of the vacuum, but of course it was a terrible slogan. Also, you, you know the Mitsubishi Pajero, it's over here, say it. Now the Spanish pronounce that as Pajero. Anyone here speaks Spanish? We had a Spanish lady in the last class, it's interesting. Okay, Pajero is a terrible, dirty word in Spanish. Especially for Paul and Man, the Pajero, he will be very angry with you. So Mitsubishi had a real problem. Do we change the name of the brand? Or do we sell it as it is? They decided to sell it as it is. And all the Spanish people in South America and, and Spain and all started laughing. Oh my God. Right? But the product was so good. The use when it was so good. Never mind the name. They still bought it in large numbers. Okay, so these are interesting aspects of language. And of course, um, I think all of you heard of the uh, story in, uh, in Dubai. I don't know if this is true or not, but I tell it in other markets about the advertisement that the person from Pepsi Cola came here and I put an advertisement about Pepsi Cola showing a man very tired and drinking a Pepsi in the second picture and then walking nicely in the third picture, but unfortunately printed in the Arabic papers. He showed the man was nicely walking, ran to Pepsi, and went like this. Okay, so, <laughs> right? Other direction. Okay, so, um, true or not, that's a nice story. Okay, currencies, we're going to talk about that. So you can see so many different things you encounter when you cross a bound. So let's look at some cultures and customs. Now this is an advertisement from HSBC who was earlier going with the slogan, the world's local bank. They changed the slogan, and I think that's a, one of the worst moves that they've made, was change the slogan. It's a very, very catchy slogan that everyone knew. So here is a thing that I have encountered. I go into, not in the UK, but in the USA. I was in a, on a sabbatical at the university, and I went to another colleague's room, a very good friend of mine in America, and he had his feet on the table like this and he didn't take his feet down. Right. Now, I knew that he was very relaxed with me. He treated me as a very good friend, and therefore, he does, if he takes his feet down, it's an insult to really. But for me, being Asian, I was really annoyed that he was talking to me with his feet on the table. So you can see that while one place is rude, if you do the same thing in another country, it is uh, one place is relaxed, the other place is to be rude. So this is the importance of local knowledge. Now, of course, the shoe is a terrible thing in Muslim countries. As you know, when Saddam Hussein's statue was put down, they were hitting the statue with the shoe. 
But the most interesting part of the shoe was when one was thrown at George Bush. Okay? And that shoe was an amazing aerodynamic shoe. It was when the aircraft industry should study that shoe. Then it came perfectly straight. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I must say that George Bush is not too bad. He sort of duck. Right? Yeah? Do you know the manufacturer? That shoe, the voice goes up. It's major. Yes, you're right. It has sold millions now. You can go and order that shoe. Okay, that's a massive price. Okay, customer based demand. Okay, massive price, and they are selling it in the millions, even now. Okay, that shoe. Shoe manufacturer, that's the best thing that ever to get. Okay, but George is not bad, isn't how he does. Okay, so. Next one, here is an interesting one. Okay, in the USA, they click the glasses and say cheers. Good luck, but Hungary, which is also in a sense a Caucasian white country, to take the glasses that that is bad luck. Now, the interesting thing is that both of these actually come from the same source. Because in Europe, in the very, very old days, okay, you had uh, beer and so on in metal glasses, metal, not glasses, metal containers, right? And you were given a drink from someone, you were, didn't crush it, that had poison. So the idea was to hit the two very hard. So one goes from one here, the other one goes here. You can drink it knowing that the same thing is what the guy who gave it. So one is, yes, it's safe to drink, good luck. Other one, you don't trust the other guy, bad luck. You can sort of deviate it. Here's one that some of you, okay, this is the. So these are interesting things about local knowledge. Okay. In most countries, the need to venture out and seek international markets has taken added significance in recent years the opening up, as I told you, of the Eastern Bloc, China, and India. Empirical studies have shown that by far the biggest motive for a company to venture abroad is for marketing reasons. Sometimes it is to get a first mover advantage. Okay, you want to be the first mover in that market. Okay, therefore, people get to know about you and your product or service. Now, I don't know the situation in the Middle East, but in Indonesia, Carrefour's was the first mover to come and show the concept of a large supermarket department store. Every other one that followed really did not have that advantage that Carrefour's did. Sometimes to get closer to a target market or to be able to take serve a particular market in the okay, way. So, for example, when Europe, even though they have signed the um, uh, free trade agreement, uh, they still used to restrict Japanese cars from entering that market. Okay, so uh, Honda gave up trying to enter, and I'll show you how they did try to stop the, the Japanese cars. Honda had a strategic alliance with Rover car company in, um, in England to <coughs> enter the market. So these are how some of the reasons why you need venture overseas. But most times it is due to the bandwagon effect of following a competitor for a venture abroad. So it could be first move advantage, it could be to get charged to the market, but most likely it is to follow a competitor who has ventured abroad. This is called the bandwagon effect. Whatever the reason, the foreign market they are entering is very different from the familiar home territory. Okay, so one of the things that you really need to think about when you're considering going overseas is Michael Porter. Now, Porter wrote a book about industry competitiveness, then he followed it by a book on competitiveness of nations. Okay, so he is sought after very much by country governments to come and give advice to them. You know, he came to Australia for two weeks. He used a couple lots and lots of my students as research assistants. But guess what his daily consulting rate is? One billion dollars per day. Definitely esteem value is the pricing of his services. Okay, one million dollars per day is his consulting fee. I don't mind being an academic in Harvard if I can command that sort of money. So Porter came up with this book and he said that you should look at what is called Porter's Diamond the demand conditions in the country you are going into, the related and supporting industries, factor endowments, and really this one here is a five forces model. All of these have been considered. So let's look at this. Let's look for example, factor endowments. 
Factor endowments would be things such as natural resources in that country. Obviously things like oil in the Middle East and coffee in Indonesia and South America and so on. The climate, the location and the demographics, the age groups. But there are advanced factors such as communication, skilled labor, research and technology. So when many countries went into China, they did so for manufacturing reasons because the demographics was such that there was a very large population of people who were able to be used as cheap labor. But when American Express went into India, they were going more for advanced factors, especially because the India had a lot of people with master's degrees level qualifications who were available to be purchased at a fairly cheap price. And also they spoke English. And uh, without upsetting the Indians over here, they spoke a sort of English that is difficult sometimes to understand, but it was still English. Okay? It was still English. So these people could have been trained to speak in the way and make English could be understood. So if you go actually I found the ANZ banking center in India, in Bangalore, the people who answer the phones talk like Australians, but I might, how are you? Right? They give an Australian name when they're in India and they have television cameras or television sets all around showing you the latest sports that's happening in Australia. So they talk to you as if they're talking from your neighborhood. Oh, you know, Hollywood lost yesterday. That's sort of thing. What's a sports club? So that was the thing. Highly skilled, educated workforce speaking English was the reason why GE and, and uh, American Express and so on went to India. Right. China, unfortunately, because of Mao Zedong and fact that all the educated people were sent to the rice fields or murder, didn't have at that time the skilled labor force. But what has China done now? It's amazing. In just, you know, 10, 15 years, they have got over all the problems of having had no real universities and so on and leap from right into the modern world. And this is why I was talking to my Arab friends over here, and I asked them, why is it that Arab countries can't do this? Okay. In such a short period of time, how did China manage to leap from and get into the high levels of education and qualifications? Uh, they had answers to me, but it's, it's, it really needs to be looked at. Education has to be a must. Some of the answers you gave, can you let the others know? about the, the amount of money spent in these countries, okay, is hardly anything compared to in other countries what they spend. Very good. In Saudi, they are focusing on that area. Demand conditions, these are the one. Okay. Demand creates capabilities, those are sophisticated demanding consumers. Now, the demand condition that Porter is talking about is the situation that happened when <coughs> companies like Toyota and Datsun went to America to make sales. Okay. These are not the reasons why American and European companies are coming to China or Bangladesh. Okay, they don't want to sell in China or Bangladesh, they want to take the product back to their own country, so they're only coming for the factor endowments or the cheap labor. I mean, if you saw today's newspaper, we talked about product safety in Bangladesh, a factory had just collapsed in Garment Factory, killing at the moment 2,000 people a day. Right? And just yesterday they told that the walls are cracking and so on, and they were told, no, go back to work today, and today the whole thing has collapsed. Okay, 2,000 people. Now, According to the news, they're trying to go after the owner of the building. But if it was in Australia, the directors would be all criminal in Okay, for sending the people back to work. Okay, so 
we are moving away from the point. Next one is related and supporting industries. Creates clusters of supporting industries that are nationally, internationally competitive. So you, you go to sell a product, you can't ignore the fact that there are other supporting industries that are required to also help you to sell that product. Okay, so you've got to have this related and supporting industry that are also of international standard. And finally, of course, the five forces, the buyers, the suppliers, the, in the, the substitutes, the ease of entry and the rivalry. You have to think about things such as domestic rivalry and what you want to do in those countries. So these are the four factors, that are four things that we looked at in the borders done. Another thing that you have to think about is this area of what is our international business strategy. Okay, so essentially what this is, is how much of customization is required. Is it low, you don't have to customize the product very much or do you have to significantly customize the product? And what is the cost that is incurred, that you have to incur to do that? the product itself. So let's look at the first one, a low, low situation, international strategy. This is typically what happened with McDonald's when they went initially from America to Europe and Australia for the first time. So they would follow international strategy. Why? Because the cost pressure, the cost of making a, a hamburger is not that great. And also, the same hamburger was wanted by the same thing, no change required for Europe and Australia. But what happened when they went into Arab countries, Muslim countries? Well, then they couldn't call it a hamburger anymore because all that was made out of beef, the word ham indicated that it may be made out of pork, which is haram. So they made it a beef burger. Right. Not much of customization, not much to change the name from a hamburger to a beef burger. But then they went to India, where beef was, uh, when the cow was a holy animal. So they couldn't call it beef anymore, nor they could, could they use beef. So they called it alu taka burger, a tikka burger, a potato burger. They used it in a potato burger, very tasty. But what they forgot was that for a long time, for about two and a half years, they were dipping the, the uh, french fries in uh, beef related oil. Okay, so when the Indians found out that they had been eating French fries made by McDonald's dipped in beef stock, they actually felt very sick, obviously. And McDonald's had a huge problem. So you've got to be careful in your customization that you don't still you think that you upset the local community. I have gone into Pizza Hut in Chinatown, in Indonesia, you get a pizza full of Chinese food on top. Right? You go to KFC in Sri Lanka, you get chicken curry okay, in KFC. Right? So, <laughs> it's true. Right? So, the reason why they can make it different is that it doesn't cost them very much to change. But now let's go this way. This way is where your cost of your product is extremely high, but still you don't have to change it very much. So this is a good example of Mercedes-Benz. Mercedes-Benz cars are at least perceived or do have very, very high standards. Okay, so that if they, whatever market they go into, they easily beat the safety standards, the pollution standards, and whatever standards required is beat. So they can sell the same car in every market, even though the car is expensive item. But take Ford for example, Ford is, has a problem because they can't sell the same Ford that they sell in America, in China, because of the different pollution standards. In fact, the pollution standards in America are so low, so lax, that many other countries, those cars cannot be sold because they don't meet the pollution standards of that country or even the safety standards of that. So in that case, they have to follow a transnational strategy. They have to customize their product to meet every market. <coughs> The CMA program, definitely it's an international strategy. The cost prices are not that high, but at the same time you can sell the same product in every market because management accountants do not need to look at local law or local tax. 
But if it's a financial accounting CBA program, it's a different matter. In that case, you have to do a little bit of multi domestic strategy to twist the local tax and the local laws. You can see in the different strategies available. Okay. So pricing in home versus world markets. Pricing is one of the elements in the marketing mix. Others being product itself, the promotion, and the method of distribution is arguably the most important variable because it reflects the result of the interaction between all the other elements in the mix. The final price is a combination of all these elements. Now when you are pricing nationally, we understand all of these aspects. Pricing strategy involved with the result of undertaking a full strategic analysis of the competitor and the consumer environment. Many analysis tools used in such analysis, such as SWOT, GAP, DCG, etc., can be used. So we've come across that sort of analysis right at the start. And so SWOT, GAP, DCG, product life cycle. We understand the market, we understand the, the environment. But when you, so if you're a company operating nationally, the external environment is familiar because it's the home country. Therefore, product portfolio decisions will be taken with reasonable knowledge and experience. But when you go international, it's a different matter. You still have to do all this analysis, your swaps and answers and so on. But of course, you are now in an unfamiliar territory. Remember, different laws, different customs, different wants, purchasing powers, influences, the knowledge often would be limited. So what do companies do? Okay. Most of them do not do international operations, they simply export. Okay. Pricing may be considered a static element. In business decisions, only by firm in place another low priority of foreign business. Such companies are content to sell, export what they can in overseas markets and look on such sales as bonus volume. This viewpoint is hardly adequate for firms with operations in foreign countries. The latter type of company must consider pricing as an active instrument for the key accomplishment of marketing objectives. Okay, now the big issue is control over end prices. Control over end prices. So let's look at what that issue is. So here is your seller. Okay, and this seller is selling to the local market and they'll be selling for a cost plus a percentage profit margin and that will be the selling price. Now, if you have a foreign buyer and the foreign buyer comes to you and buys it from you, from your warehouse, then no problem, okay? You will sell it to them at cost plus cost profit margin equals selling price. Same as a local buyer, if they come and buy it from you in this location here. But the buyer might say, look, can you put it on a ship for us and charge us the fees for doing it. Say no problem. So I'll pay for transport. I'll pay for transport. And what you charge the person is called C and sorry. F O B price. F O B price. Free on board. F O B. So you put the thing on a ship. Okay, so it will be selling price plus transport charge. But the buyer might say, look, you may be able to get good deals from your shipping agent. Can you also pay the freight? By the way, the legal responsibility of this product is now the, it's owned by the buyer. Okay, moment to put it on the ship. Okay, you pay for the freight. Well, then you have this would be called C and F price cost and freight. But the buyer might say, look, what if the ship six? We can take the insurance, but can you take the insurance? He said, no problem. We'll also pay for the insurance. 
and we will charge you for it. That is known as a CIF price, cost insurance and freight. Okay, now the ship comes to the border of the buyer. At this point, number of charges are paid all by the buyer. This is import fees. Um, uh, taxes, GST, clearance fees, all such a fees are paid. All paid by the buyer. And then the buyer will take it to their warehouse so that we transport as well. Now the buyer might say, look, can you pay all that as well? And the seller pay all that and charge us for it. No problem. We can calculate what these things are going to be and so on. And the charge that we will have is called a DIS charge, direct into store, or FIS charge, free into store. Okay. So now if you go to Dell Computers, they will give you a FIS price right to your doorstep what the price is, after paying the duties and everything. Right, but that, that's not the end. In the case of their computer, you are the end user, but the, if you are a buyer, send it to a local market, then you have to take this FIS price and your own profit margin and send it to the end user. So you can see how the prices increase. Now this is not the only things that happen. There is also lots of documentation that goes on. Along with the ship, whole lot of documents go. The invoice, which will be of course at CNF, CIF, etc. prices. The uh, fumigation certificate. The packing list. <laughs> Certificate of origin and of course a very important thing for the bill of lading. The bill of lading. Okay? Now copies go to on the ship, copies go to you, copies go to your bank. Okay, now all of this comes and the goods are delivered. But the problem is that the buyer doesn't pay. So what do you do to safeguard that? Well, yes, first of all, you can go to your bank and get, a, no, not your bank, you can get the buyer's bank to give you a guarantee. The guarantee could be called a DA, Document of Acceptance. So that is given to your bank. A DA. Okay. Now I heard the word LC, we will come to that in a minute. A DA, a document of acceptance, is that this bank, the buyer's bank, is guaranteed that if the buyer has the money in the account, they will pay. But if the buyer has taken the money out of his account and there is no money in his account, then we will not pay. So there is a bit of risk in that. So to make sure that the risk is Avoided, we have a stronger form of a DA, which is called a LC, letter of credit. In this case, this bank will go and make sure the buyer puts the money in their bank account, which is locked away, cannot be removed. And when the, the bill of lading and the invoice comes and it's signed off by the buyer, the money will be sent from that frozen account. That is a strong one. Now the only way that that could be a problem is if this bank actually collapses. Which has happened when China opened up initially, a couple of Chinese banks were not there when we want to collect on the LC. But of course these days the Bank of China and so on is pretty, very, very good. So that you can see the amount of things that are happening when you have a foreign trade. Okay, now 
all of these things are called incoterms. Okay, incoterms, international commerce terms. And they are slight, they are mainly to do with shipping. They are slightly different when they are aircraft, air freight. Does anyone know some of the air freight terms? Similar terms? Yes, what are the terms that we use? Instead of FOB, there's something else. FC. FC. Yeah, what does it stand for? Freight and carriage allowed. That's right. Freight and carriage allowed. Carriage allowed. And then with the insurance, something else is there a way. So FCA is the main one. Freight and carriage allowed. That is like CNF. I'm not sure if the insurance is covered in there. Sorry? But now they are using these other terms for your freight. Yes. No stronger form of payment. LC is the strongest form. Unless you get the money up front. Yes. Okay. Why? Well, what's the reason? Unless the bank collapses. Okay, that's a big thing. Yes, you are right. You see, you can still get these problems. Let's talk about that. So the buyer gets the thing, the bank pays on the LC, and when the time comes for them to open the commodity, okay, this happened to one of my clients, who ordered methylated spirits from Japan, and when three months later when they wanted to open it, they opened it, it was all water. Okay, the product was not in conformance with the specifications, but the LC had been paid. So he flew to Japan. By the time he flew, this same Japanese guy, remember Japan, had been caught, father thing, and was in jail. And the Japanese police told him, you know, we can't do much, he's in jail already. If you want, we'll turn the other way, you can work it in. So he said, Austria, I the big guy. Austria guy said, how can I hit the guy? And so he came home, no money. Other cases, um, so what you do in that case, if you are very concerned about the supplier, then you have to have your own people here in the other country before they are packing to check on the and give a uh, certificate. Yes. Just uh, uh, I have a little experience in the LOC. Okay. Usually, uh, LOC uh, depends on the terms and the condition. So, for example, for the case of the material, we you don't need to send a few people. There is international inspectors like Moody, for example. Correct, correct. Yes. They inspect. How will you pay? And they get a certificate and just pay a uh, minor pay, yes, cost. Yes. Also for the terms and the condition, yeah. just you need to free the terms and the condition from the buyer signing or buyer acceptance. Just keep it with the documents on. Because if, uh, if you put the buyer acceptance or a signing, signing you are removing the control from your side to his side. Yes, correct. So just you need to negotiate with him that the document should be limited, not too much. Because sometimes you put a, a huge document in order to fill in the discrepancy. Okay, so what, what, what if your buyer refuses to sign that, saying, and it's a very large buyer. A very large buyer, it's a large order for you. But they say, if you want the order, we will not sign that. In this case, you have to calculate the risk. You have to calculate the risk. You have to calculate Correct. the risk. Because yes. in the on one side, you need to, to, to sell to him. Okay? In the other side, yes. there is a terms and the condition. Right. Uh, it can uh, threat. Uh, and it, even if it's a big buyer, yes. okay, with this size, usually they will not uh, do uh, hopefully, this hopefully. It, uh, usually. Yes. Okay? Unless uh, you are doubting that it's new. It, and if it's new and they are opening it, is usually you have to get some advances in the other side. So we have to put some advance. Or get bank guarantee if it's a big buyer. Yeah, I mean, China these days is a huge import of raw materials. I can tell you an exact case what happened. It was a company that was involved in Indonesia, sent a lot of mining product to China. Okay? The ship came, they refused acceptance saying there's not a common specification. For some reason, it shows some problem. The ship was out there earning demerage. Right? And then the customs went and said, okay, we are going to sell it now because you know it's in limbo. They are not accepting, you are not taking back. Right? So they came and sold the, the customs sold the product. It was purchased by another Chinese company for one third the price. And the other Chinese company was probably the uncle of the, this company. Right? 
So now what we do is whenever we send a large order, especially to China, we always have a second buyer ready. If there is any discrepancy, the ship will immediately turn around to the second buyer. Okay, otherwise, you are going to have a situation which the uncle will be buying the product. Yeah, yeah. The moment the Chinese find they have turned the ship around, they say no problem. Yeah, but, but the LC is trying to maintain it, it doesn't put the price over whatever the position. 
I mean, you might be finally selling at a loss. Okay, uh, yes. Can we customize the product, give the same feature, same quality, but lower uh, uh, lower quality component? Yeah, that's actually a hugely problematic exercise for a single or so on. You are trying to, uh, okay, maybe some product you can use cheaper materials and so on and bring down the cost, but you are talking about a value engineering exercise, okay, which is uh, can be a big problem for simply one customized order. Okay. Any other method? Okay, so that's a good point. Rather than exporting, let us set up uh, operations in the foreign country, but really for a single or two containers, you are not going to do that. Okay. Sorry. Okay, so again, subcontracting, joint venture agreements, franchising, takes time. Here we've got a large order, but a single order, and the buyer is saying, can you sweeten the deal for us? Yeah. Okay, before you answer, I'm going to once again remind everyone the, the, the context. This is a profitable company in the home market. Spending the uh, 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 increasing the quantity which I'm selling, so I'm expanding the market. He wants only two containers, let us see. Reduce my profit margin. Reduce my profit margin. Reduce the ask the buyer, hey, he can't do much. Reduce your profit margin. Yeah. Buyer says, sorry, then we don't want to buy because we must have a profit margin. So you can reduce your profit margin. Right? Yes, yeah, so. Yes, it can still not up here. Can you less margin? There is a better term that we can use. Yeah, because Okay, I'm going to give you a little bit more of a clue. Cost volume profit analysis. Does that give you a clue of what you can do? What is cost volume profit analysis? Selling price minus variable cost equals is contribution minus fixed cost equals profit. So what does that tell you about this problem we have? Sorry? Yeah, but more information. The volume is not just to okay. The thing is this is a profitable company in the home market. That means all of their fixed costs are covered. Profitable, right? So you don't need to charge the fixed cost again on this this order. The fixed cost has already been covered by the local market. So rather than full cost, we can keep the profit margin the same. We we'll price it at variable cost. Okay, that's what you could do at marginal variable cost. That's the lowest that you can go because you have covered the fixed cost. This is why it is so important to think about this area of cost for the profit. Yeah, yeah, I mean, once you do that, we can find out how much more you can go up, but once you take the variable, because it, it helps everything. I mean, often transport, freight, insurance, all is to do with invoice price. Import fees, all of this. Huge reduction across the board that you can show by, by pricing it on variable cost only. But there could be a problem. So let's look at that. So many from the real to the thing to ship net pricing. That is to price receive from goods when shipped from their plant at FOB, CNA, CIL, BS prices. These are called INCO prices. Okay, or INCO terms. Such companies desire to control not in price, but what they must receive for the product ship. Such a method still needs to consider cost and market considerations because while a company should not sell goods because of the cost of production, the company still cannot sell goods at a price that will not be exported to the overseas market. So, let's now look at cost price relationships. Those using full <coughs> absorption costing, full cost, fixed and variable, will insist that no unit of a product, of a similar product, is different from any other in terms of cost, and that each bears its full share of cost. Now, you are told that Dell is like this. As a matter of where you sell, uh, where you buy the product, except for the variations in import fees and transport and so on, the actual cost that they sell it to you is the full cost. 
firm using marginal cost of metals on the other hand, regard foreign sales as bonus sales, and assume that any return over their variable cost makes a contribution towards their profit because they've already covered their fixed costs. They can thus be very competitive by selling in international markets or less than the domestic markets. But what's the problem? They might be subject to anti-dumping penalties. Okay? The foreign buyers custom say you are now dumping the product. Okay? You are dumping it. You are selling it at a price, the, the definition of dumping is you are selling it at a price cheaper than at the home market. Okay, and so we are going to tax you extra, this is called a countervailing or anti dumping penalty. Okay, so let's look at this word dumping. I told you that when Toyota went to America, they priced their product at a much cheaper rate than in Japan. And the American said, come in, come in, penetration price. Today, if Toyota tries to do the same thing in America, sorry, dumping. China, with say Malaysian proton, sells protons, or brings protons into Australia at a cheaper price than in Malaysia. Customs say, come in, penetration pricing. China is selling their products in Australia at a much cheaper rate than China. No problem, come in. Toyota tries to do the same thing and now I am not to do the same thing. Sorry. Dumping. What's the difference? It's obvious what the difference is. Yes? The needs of this uh, market. For example, Australian government needs the, the, the Chinese product, so they will not, ha they will not increase the anti-dumping uh, uh, fees or something like that. However, in the, in the US market, they, they want to, 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 to to expand their, their car manufacturer market share, so they will increase uh, the, they are protecting their, the country product themselves. Uh, you, you sort of answered the question, yes. You see, governments have this difficult balancing act. They want to give products at a cheap rate to their uh, voters who want them into power, or who are their subjects. But at the same time, they don't want to kill the local industry. So. After World War II, getting Toyota to come to USA would not have killed General Motors or Ford or Chrysler. But if they do it today, after the esteem values and so on of Toyota, General Motors will be finished. But similarly, Australia doesn't mind Chinese products or Malaysian products coming in and helping out the poorer people in Australia. But they won't allow Toyota to do the same thing. Because if Toyota comes in with cheaper prices, end of Australian cars. Already our Australian car market is in trouble. So that's the difference. Does it affect the local industry and the jobs locally? So if it doesn't, come in, then pressure pricing. If it does, sorry, nothing. Okay. So generally, full cost insurance regard themselves as world marketers, and marginal pricing firm regard themselves either as marketers exporting for one country to another, or as world marketer depending on the company policy and objectives. However, both types of firms, in addition to cost recoupment, in the long run must also consider the marketplace. Only firms which are not extremely active in overseas marketing, price goods based solely on a cost basis, basis be it full cost or marginal cost. A true multinational will include pricing in just one part of the marketing mix. We will be aware of such alternatives as market segmentation, country to country. You just told an example about telecom, market segmentation and the pricing, competitive pricing in the marketplace, the use of currency fluctuations in the market, and other market-oriented pricing, advertising, and distribution factors. Okay, so now let's look at some of the unique global marketing costs. One is tariffs. This could be a specific duty, either tax charge or uh, fiscal item imported. You can have an ad valorem duty, which is there is a percentage of the value, and maybe combination tariffs, a combination of the two. So these are tariffs. Then you have fees for import certificates. These can assume such levels that they are in fact import taxes. And often these sort of import certificates and other regulation is used to prevent overseas people from coming. So even though, as I told you, 
the European companies, countries had signed the agreement for free trade. They used to prevent the Japanese cars from coming, not through any thing, but these sorts of import certificates and other regulations. Because when a Japanese ship full of a ship full of Japanese cars comes to France, they were sent to a port in Marseille. Only they could only go to Marseille, and the man who signed and stamped the clearing certificate was often on holiday. So the ship was out there waiting for clearance for one, two weeks, incurring demerage. Right? And the Japanese realized very soon that that guy had been asked to go permanently on holiday. Okay, so that the Japanese cars can't come into the country. So although they are technically should have accepted the things because of regulations, they prevented it. That you can see lots of these things happening even in Dubai and Australia and so on, these regulations to try to prevent people from coming in. Taxes, purchase excise taxes, are the various categories that are good, excise taxes is for liquor, and value added on turnover taxes, these apply as the product goes through the channels of distribution, so as you pass through from one hand to another. Middleman costs, because there are more people handling your overseas product, there will be more things to pay, but also, traditionally, <coughs> middleman's profit margins will be higher for handling an overseas product than a local product. So, and also there is this aspect of level of middleman infrastructure development. Okay, further unanticipated costs may emerge because the market and channel of distribution infrastructure in foreign countries is so underdeveloped. Now, underdeveloped is used in a relative sense. For example, the Campbell Soup Company found that middleman cost to be 30% higher in the UK than the US. Now, both are developed countries, but their distribution system, one was underdeveloped compared to the other. This resulted in the company changing both its price patterns and structuring of the channel system. Okay? There are examples where marketers are having to bear increased financial costs when dealing with underfinanced middlemen and having to incur extra expenses of warehousing and handling of small shipments. You know, Nestle, one of the biggest companies in the world, operating over, almost in every country in the world. Okay? They have in fact gone and built roads, okay, set up distribution channels simply to get their product to go to the market. They have built the roads. Okay, so these are things that happen. Mercedes-Benz, when China opened out and India opened out, they went and set up their showrooms. Now, I don't know, some of you have said, what to Mercedes-Benz showroom in Australia and, may, and over here for sure. You don't go and look at a car and kick the tires. Okay, these days, you go to Mercedes-Benz showroom, the salesman doesn't even show you the car. They take you and sit you down and you give you a latte, they ask you latte or cappuccino and then you drink coffee and you discuss the philosophy of Mercedes-Benz. And maybe you go and have a look at the car. So there is an upmarket coffee and coffee house atmosphere in many of the showrooms. They do have a stock, but it's sort of, you know, they are, it's obviously that you are a Mercedes-Benz client. Okay, they talk about those sorts of philosophies. So that is a very expensive exercise to do and they found that the, the joint venture partners in China and India initially couldn't afford it. So Mercedes-Benz had to themselves spend money to build the warehouses, uh, shut the showrooms, and they had to also give consignment stocks at their cost, okay, until these uh, companies became financially viable. Okay, so all of this may result in price escalation. Business are traveling abroad are often surprised to find that goods that are relatively inexpensive in their own country are priced outrageously in other countries. You may have seen it's something that is very cheap in say India, ridiculous price in Dubai. They naturally think that this is because of profiteering and they decide to export or crack the market. But what you should be showing you is that it may have nothing to do with excess profits. It may be because of the unique global marketing cost. So it is whatever, no matter how much a company wishes to market its product in a foreign country price that it goes to its own country, it has little opportunity to offer such control. That's because of all of these reasons of price escalation. Okay, so here's an example. This is an example of a country that has a sales tax only. 
Okay, so one dollar domestic example with a 30 and one third percent uh, wholesale margin and a 50 percent retailer margin and a turnover tax which is similar to us in this case a sales tax of 27 percent. The final price is two dollars forty. Take away the taxes but introduce insurance and freight to a foreign buyer and a tariff is gone up by 15 percent even though you've taken away the sales tax. Add on more people handling the product, importers and so on, almost double the price, still no taxes. Introduce a turnover tax where, like what we have in Dubai, where the tax at one level is refunded in the other level, up by the PM 130%. And some countries, there is no refund. You pay a tax at every level, 165. Okay, so you can see one dollar, two dollars for two, six dollars thirty-seven. Okay, that would be the sort of price escalation we are looking at. Okay, so what can you do about price escalation? The problems called the price escalation must be approved in a strategic manner. Here are some approaches suggested. Accept the lower net price or absorb the trade. But now you are, some of you told me that when you were discussing what to do. Okay, you may wish to absorb these costs. But the problem or sell at a variable cost, but the problem is that you will be careful if you are not accused of dumping. Get the product into different rate category. That's often done. Okay? Body, by modifying the product in some way or by shipping only components and assembly then in the foreign country, they set up operations here. Assembly operation, that's what Swatch did in Australia. They set up a small assembly plant to get rid of all these lots and lots of uh, import taxes and so on. on a complete approach. Here the management accountant must consider the cost factor that is sending abroad versus assembling domestically class carriers. And then of course going to overseas production. So here you have to think about what is done. A logical alternative if the manufacturer is adequately financed, property and labor available in a foreign country, and the foreign market to support such a productive facility in terms of sales volume. So that is the the local demand conditions. And also here is the factor endowments. There may be others who might think about getting rid of the people handling your product completely. Either shorten the channels of distribution or get rid of them. Now that's what they'll be. They'll decide that we're not going to have any wholesalers or retailers or retail stores. We go straight to the customer. So except in some countries where they had to have a small um, small place for uh, repairs. Okay, now in Australia there is no repair place for you your uh, computer goes off, you just send it back and you get a new one. Right? Under the warranty period. So those sorts of things they decided to do and later on I'll give you the numbers behind it, that means they have no people handling at all. In other cases they may shorten the channels of issue. Now, in some cases, interestingly, you might actually increase the number of distributors to take advantage of some tax condition. So here are two examples. First one was the example that is mentioned here, which is Unilever in Sri Lanka. When I was doing the audit for Unilever, when I was at KPMG, there was an interesting situation. Sri Lanka at that time, the tax law, if a manufacturer sells to a retailer or a wholesaler, they were charged a 35% business turnover tax. Huge. But if a wholesaler sells to a retailer, it was only a 5% business turnover tax. So what did Unilever do? It set up essentially a company called Unilever Wholesaling, Wholesale and Marketing. They're just a man with a, a, a ledger, okay? Same company, same desk, okay? And so they sold from the manufacturer to the wholesaler at a very low cost, very low cost, okay? But that incurred 35%. And then it increased the cost and only incurred the 5%. So by increasing the channels of distribution, they were able to save money. Another example. SAFTA agreement, Pakistan, 
India, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, part of the SEFTA, South Asian Free Trade Agreement. But along with these big countries would be countries like Bhutan. So what the Reynolds Pen Company in India found out was that they were bringing in refills from France and paying a huge amount of tariff when they brought it in. But for some obscure old reason, refills from France to Bhutan had no taxes. So they set up a small operation here and they brought the refills and just, just, just delivered it to the local content. Okay, and they sent it to here, and because of SEFTA, there was no, no taxes. So by increasing the channels of distribution, they were able to reduce costs. So basically, we know the tax laws. Now, there is another interesting issue that is really nothing to do with price, but something you have to be careful of, is intellectual property. This is an article from the Australian about an Australian company that went to a Chinese trade fair for toys. He put out his latest toy one afternoon. The next day the, the show opened and the Chinese had the same toy. It had taken them overnight to copy the toys. Okay, so they were very, very upset and all that about intellectual property and so on. Okay, so however, I have a different view, although my view will be not taken into account. Okay, you see, America is the biggest problem actually intellectual property, not China. Why? Because America thinks it can just do anything it wants. So it went and trademarked Basmati, trademarked saffron. Things that India and Pakistan have been using for years was trademarked by the US. It took the Indian and Pakistani governments over five, six years to break that trademark. Okay? Then Mickey Mouse, things like that, they have the 50 year uh, protection on copyright. After 50 years, the copyright protection stops. So, Mickey Mouse is coming up for uh, release of copyright in 1994. All the Hong Kong manufacturers that were copying Mickey Mouse without paying the tax now were going to do it officially. About a week before that, uh, it came up to the point where the copyright was released. You will say without asking any other country unilaterally put forward the copyright law by another 50 years. So now it's 100 years. Didn't ask any other country. Just did it. Because they're America. So I basically had the view that if America can put copyright laws forward, countries like China should put the copyright laws backwards. Okay, for example, every trouser that we are wearing is a Chinese invention. So China should say every single Levi's trouser stripe trouser the last 200 years pay us a lot because you have taken our intellectual property. Or the Indians who came up with the concept of zero should say every time you use zero pay us a lot. Okay, unfortunately we don't have the power to, to do that. Okay, so why should only modern thinking get copyright protection but not all the old thinking? Okay, now the case that Apple won against Samsung. They not only got various things that Samsung was doing in their phone, all of these icons that you have, okay, all these icons, but Apple tried to also copyright this circuit, this square shape with rounded corners. And that's the only thing that Apple lost. Apple, the only thing Apple lost was Samsung lawyers argued that no one can actually copyright a square with rounded circles rounded edges. But Apple tried to do that as well. Okay, so certainly India is a case for the concept of zero. Okay, but it won't happen unfortunately. Okay, so anyway, that's my view for what it's worth. Now we take a short, short break, but before that I thought I'll show you this one. Welcome to McDonald's <laughs> in Pakistan. In Pakistan is I think how was McDonald's is even given its whole number. Okay. <laughs> I don't think Mutana will go after this guy, but it's uh, interesting where intellectual property is concerned. Okay, so we are going to now look at international finance issues in our MBA class. Okay, so we are coming across this 
issue of currency exposure. The pricing of products also plays an important role in the company's corporate exposure management strategy. Same topic. The company operating in a foreign land deals with two currencies, an asset, liability or income stream, where in a foreign currency is said to be exposed to exchange risk. When a currency movement changes its home currency value, positively or negatively. Of course, in the negative result, that is the risk. Now, the area of exchange exposure management is vast and of a specialized nature. So we are not going to cover everything. But the purpose of this presentation is to essentially give a general overview of currency exposure and especially its role in pricing. Okay, the role of pricing in this risk reduction. Now there are three basic types of currency exposure. <coughs> there is translation exposure, transaction exposure and economic exposure. Translation exposure is what we call accounting exposure, financial accounting exposure where which arises in the consolidation of accounts. When the book value of foreign assets is translated into parent company's currency at current exchange rates. This figure is compared to the historical value of the asset on the date of transfer and the translation loss of the annual result. What happens is of course that there are three different methods of translation. <coughs> Uh, exposure recognized by the accounting profession even under IFRS. <coughs> the first method is where everything in the income statement and the balance sheet is translated at end of financial year rate, exchange rate. Okay, so if every number is either multiplied or divided by the exchange rate, then of course there will be no problem in the balance sheet because uh, the balance sheet is still balanced. But Many, com many countries, I mean hardly anyone does that simple, most logical method. What they do is a little different. They do the income statement on average rate for the year and the balance sheet on the balance sheet rate. Now that one of course will have a difference like a suspense account of where it doesn't balance. The third method, the one that is recommended by the IFRS, is the one that is most confusing. This is where your assets, certain assets, are translated on the historical cost principle, so they, on the date of historical cost. Others are translated based on fair value prices. Okay, so the income statement is on average, and the balance sheet, depending on the asset, it has a different translation amount. Okay, highly confusing, but one that is recommended for various reasons. Anyway, where management account is concerned, we don't care about the three methods because it is all to do with the past. Depending on the method used, one could show either losses or gains in the same set of accounts. Accounting translation is very much an arbitrary process. The outcome may have very little to do with economic value. So economic value, we look at the future. That is, the effect of currency movements on expected future price growth. <coughs> so the first of the economic type of exposure is transaction exposure. This involves the actual flows of involved in exchange transactions in a period where currency is received represent cash inflows and currency dispersed represent cash outflows. When a currency that dominates cash inflows depreciates, relative to the currency that dominates cash outflows, a foreign exchange loss occurs. And the reverse is when the dominant currency appreciates. Now, of course, you all know this very well. If you have especially got a a child in an overseas school, <coughs> say in England or Australia or something like that, you know very well about transaction exposure because you know the amount of money that you got and had to spend and what the exchange rate was. So transaction exposure, definitely something that is very, you don't really care about past. Okay, what is important is the impact today. Thus transaction exposure management techniques concentrate on known exchange transaction that may result in an actual cash loss or gain to the company and the company's tax positions if the realized gains or losses are taxable or allowable against tax. Now the thing is that <coughs> transaction exposure ignores future cash flows which currently do not involve exchange transaction during a special period but still create economic value. So for example, if you send your child for a three-year degree in England, 
you spend for the first year, that's transaction exposure, but you have committed yourself to spending for the next two years. So that will not be covered by transaction exposure, but it's certainly going to be something you're concerned with because it's going to be something you have to pay for in the future. So this, for example, there may be undeclared dividends or a volume of local say that cannot be identified with the exchange transaction to the current period. So therefore, we have this term economic exposure, in which transaction exposure is part of it. This technique focuses on economic value of the firm. That is the impact of exchange rate fluctuation on all of the firm's expected future cash flows. Thus, transaction exposure is considered to be only a component of overall economic exposure. <coughs> so, now, an exchange fluctuation is considered, is not considered, sorry, to be an isolated phenomenon in the economy. Along with the fluctuation is so many things happen. So with it are changes in aggregate demand and changes in the price. As these changes affect the firm's expected net present value from operations, the gain or loss on the value of the firm resulting from the movement in exchange rates can be seen as the difference between the net present value of the foreign operations before the exchange fluctuation and after it, where both values are expressed in terms of the parent company's currency. So let's look at an example of that. <coughs> Now, in Australia, at a particular point in time, some years ago, there were some, only a few luxury car manufacturers compared to what we have in Dubai. We had the Mercedes-Benz, we had the BMW, and the Audi from Germany. We had the Jaguar from England, Now we also had the Rolls-Royce and the Aston Martin and so on, but those are considered either hotels or wheels or exotic men's toys that are the main luxury car for the mass market. Then we have the Lexus from Japan. We didn't have infinity at that time, but we just got it now. We had the Alfa Romeo from Italy. We did have the Ferraris and the Lamborghinis and the Maserati, but once again these are exotic to toys like the Porsche from Germany or Sweden. And then we have from Sweden, the Volvo and the Saab. Okay, these are the main brands that were competing in this particular market, other than the exotic toys. So what happened in this particular period of time was the Australian dollar depreciated against the Deutsche Mark, which is before there was the Euro, depreciated against the pound sterling, Depreciated against the Japanese yen, depreciated against the Italian lira, but appreciated against the Swedish krona. Okay, so each of these companies where the Australian dollar depreciated had to put its prices up if it was going to <coughs> have the same uh, amount of money transferred to their home country, but. Volvo and Saab had the luxury of three possibilities. Because the competition is putting the prices up, they also could put their prices up accordingly. Or they could keep their prices the same and take the benefit of the exchange rate uh, that was in their favor. Or they could pass on the benefit to the consumer by lowering their prices. Okay, so Volvo decided to keep their prices the same, thereby they were a little bit more attractive than the uh, car, other cars after they put their prices up. But Saab, being a very ethical sort of, it's, a, it's into these green businesses and all of this, Saab decided to put its prices down and give the consumer the benefit. So what happened, of course, was that Saab suddenly had an increase in demand because now more people, including myself, could afford that car. Okay, and so as more Saabs were sold, 
and it's the same number of money going back to the parent company, but now with a higher volume, the net present value of farm operations became higher. So Saab did very well by reducing their prices. Okay. So that is what would happen. Okay, the both company tells the uh, both values are expected to tell the parent company's currency. Now let me ask you, do you think that what Saab did was a good thing? I mean they certainly did increase their net present value. Okay, at least in that period. What do you think? Was it good or bad? No? Why? It will go down from the level to now that more people will want the gas. More people want the gas, so not exclusive anymore? Yes, yeah, so esteem value is lost, right? Is that, that is exactly what happened. Now, although the same thing happened in the US dollar, in America they didn't put the prices down, they could put the prices up and it was considered a very steep car. But in Australia, what happened was, Saab was putting his prices down. Honda and Toyota, because of the yen being going up, was putting his prices up. And suddenly, Honda and Toyota were the same prices as Saab. So where is the exclusivity of the European name? Okay, the selling for the same as the Honda and the Toyota at that time. It was a very bad mistake. So even though short term net present value went up, they took years to get its prestige value back again in Australia. In fact, they never did. Because what happened was that they were taken over by General Motors and General Motors went uh, virtually bankrupt and they sold the operations to a Dutch company that finally sold it to a Chinese company. So like Volvo, Saab is now owned by China and they are going to put out an Indian electric car. So that's what happened then, but in this point of time, that was a very bad move. I mean today, Jaguar is owned by India, Volvo is owned by China, Saab is owned by China, uh, Rosas is owned by BMW, Bentley is owned by Volkswagen, Okay, Lotus is owned by Proton in, in Malaysia and so on. I mean, you don't know exactly what you're buying. Range Rover is owned by India, Tata. Okay, so I don't know when these European prestige marks, they are all going away from their own countries. So you can see the new economic value of the firm, therefore we will be in the interaction between the new economic conditions, the new exchange rates, <coughs> the cash flow expected, and the management's reaction to these changes. In the case of Saab, even though they made ethical reaction by giving the benefit to the consumer from a marketing point of view and an esteem value point of view, that is a very bad mistake. Okay, so what are the components or what are the components of the new economic value of the firm? The major component that will affect the this interaction process and the specific question that should be asked for each component are listed below. First of all, sales revenue. <coughs> Would the new economic conditions and new exchange rate affect aggregate demand and market size? Certainly that happened to some. Are price increases possible? By how much and how fast? And would these price changes affect demand and market share? So these are all sales revenue related. Then there is cost of sales. Would change in this market size and market share as if they're finding alternate sources of supply? especially for a component manufacturer. You will now not be able to buy from Germany and have to go to China. Will inflation cost increases occur? And would improvements in production efficiency be required? You would have to re-engineer your product, value engineer your product because of these changes. Financing costs. If devaluation results in rising input costs and the need for increased sales volume, would there be a resultant increase in the cash type of capital? And that in fact happened in the Saab case. Why? Because when there was a larger demand for their product, they had to bring more stock into the country, so their inventory levels went up. There were more people now owning, owing their money, consumer went up. You can see that that is all going to involve financing costs. With the rise in interest rates that usually occurs, the devaluation expected remain high after the devaluation if continuing inflation pressure are expected. So this is known as the Fisher principle. The Fisher principle or the Fisher effect.
and that is because there's a link between exchange rates and interest rates. When interest rates go up, now Australian interest rate is about 4.25%. USA's interest rate often is almost zero. You're getting no interest for cash in the bank. So there would be a demand for the Australian dollar because they will be wanting the Australian dollar to invest in the Australian banking system. So then there will be a people who want that dollar and therefore the exchange rate of the Australian dollar is today higher than the US dollar. In 2008 when the global financial crisis came, the Australian dollar was only 0.65 of the US dollar. Right? Today it is more than that. Okay, so there is a big demand. Of course what happens is that when, they, when the Australian dollar becomes too high, then of course imports start getting affected and all of these things, the bankers might then either depreciate that dollar in some way by using fiscal policy or the interest rate will come down. Okay, so these are things that could happen. There's a link between the two. Oops. Okay, there's something like here. I'm going to fix that problem. Okay. So now let's look at economic exposure and risk management targets. The major components of economic exposure, in fact, offer two targets for risk management. Financial hedging policies and adjustments in operations. So what are hedging policies? Often both buyers and sellers locking the exchange rate at which a transaction in the future is going to be affected. This is called hedging. In theory, hedging is needed mainly to counter only, count only during a transitional period, or it should be only adjustments during a transitional period until operations are adjusted. So operational policies cannot compensate fully for exchange fluctuations after this adjustment period, then some reconsideration may be given regarding both the foreign investment and the foreign financing decision. So let's look at that one. So what is hedging? You are the seller, here is the buyer. You sell something, let us say at $1,000 US, but the buyer has to pay in 30 days. So when 30 days comes up, you are worried that the $1,000 that you get is now going to be worth less in your own currency. So you will go to the bank and say, hey, my bank, can you lock in the $1,000 US at the rate, today's rate, so that in 30 days when I get the money, I get the same rate. The bank says, no problem at all, you can do it, and the bank charges a fee for doing that. On the other hand, the buyer has the reverse situation. It is worried that in 30 days when it requires a $1,000, the local money here will there will be more money required. So the buyer goes to their bank and takes the reverse situation. Look, when I want the US dollar in 30 days, can you lock it to me at the today's rate? Okay, in 30 days time. So the bank says no problem and they charge a fee. Okay, so come 30 days, the buyer gets the money locked in the thousand dollars base here and this guy gets the local currency. So, everyone appears to be happy. But is that a good thing? Should you be hedging everything? Because what happens if in fact the, the thing goes the other way? If in fact this one you can get more local money because this depreciates and this one you can get it with less. But if it's the other way around? Then you have lost all the opportunities. So all hedging does is that it uh, locks in your downside risk to the bank fee, but the upside potential is completely lost. Okay, you got it? So theoretically, the theory is clear, do not hedge everything. You should only hedge during some transitional period until your operation themselves can adjust for it by changing the prices, changing the mode of operation and so on. Okay, so that's the theory. But in practice, 
almost 100% of firms hedge everything. Why is that? They lose all the up upside potential. Anyone here into currency hedging? Okay. Do you all hedge everything? No. You all don't? Oh, very good. What about you all? No. Okay, what do you all do? That's good. Good examples against what I said. Why do you not hedge everything? Right. We used to deal with around 20 banks. Right.
business. So our business is engineering, our business is trading, like that. So this, I don't buy this, this not a business argument. I mean, some of the people who are in businesses, are in businesses that are more risky than the currency risk. Okay, so actually not in the currency risk is a lesser risk than the business itself. Okay, I'll tell you why managers is asking you to, to hedge and why you're doing it without any question. Not for the sake of the company, but for the sake of your job. Okay, you are risk, you are hedging your own job. Because if the currency goes in your favor and you have and not hedged, they will say, ah, well done. But if the currency goes against you and you have not hedged, you are fine. Okay, there's a far higher downside risk for your job by not hedging than hedging. So most people hedge so that no one can fight for it. Yeah, they lost by hedging. Sri Lanka said it happened. Yeah, Sri Lanka exactly the same. Massive, but it was taken by some minister's friend, so no one was ever. Yes. Chairman of the Central Bank was involved in it, and everything was hushed up. Massive process, not for it. Okay, so this. So the best scenario for this is much changing now. What is the best scenario to take action? Okay, the scenario is that, I mean, this is theoretical, okay? Theoretically, some companies are realizing that they should not hedge everything because there is a risk that you are losing the upside potential. So what they are doing is now, they are allowing bands. Okay? So within these two bands of currency, they are allowing, doesn't matter the size of the invoice or whatever, they are allowing hedging. And no one will find fault with you within these bands if you have hedged or not hedged. Right? But beyond these two extremes, if it's coming close here or it's coming close here, then you have to hedge. So they're giving you, giving management some window of opportunity to take a decision if you hedge or not hedge, rather than hedge everything. That is the closest practical thing that I have found in companies. Okay? Volume. Uh, uh, not volume, but the the they, they give two bands for the exchange rate. Between this rate and this rate, we don't, we want, we're not going to question you if something happens. And you're not going to lose your job. That's the pound rate. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so like I said, the pound, if you take between 6 and 4, okay, we allow, but if it's coming close to 6 or going here, then you have to hedge. But not all, I mean, very few companies even do this. Most of the companies hedge everything because of this downside risk of losing your job. Okay, the other one is adjustments in operations. In the longer term, adjustments in operations will be affected, and pricing policy plays a key role in such a strategy. As mentioned earlier, such pricing strategies evolve as a result of undertaking a full strategic analysis of the competitive and consumer environment. So we have to look at our operations by looking at our spots and caps and so on. Using a pricing policy, the in internal technique of expensive management must therefore be within the constraint imposed by the above analysis and strategies. But once you look at that, there are two types of pricing policy that you can do. The price variations method and the currency invoicing method. Price variation method is exactly what we mentioned here. It occurs in situations where selling prices are increased to offset adverse effects of exchange rate fluctuations. Now you have, can ask the question, why were price, why prices could not have been raised before the fluctuation? I mean surely, in this case over here, if Mercedes-Benz and so on could have increased their prices because the Australian dollar reduced, why did they not increase it before that? Why did they have to wait for the exchange rate fluctuation? Well, mainly because of competitive conditions. And there's other reasons of price control. Effectiveness of the depends on the price adjustments that the competitive situation, you can see that everyone had to increase their prices, so therefore you could. This is not something that has happened before. Customer credibility. Customer credibility, you can't keep on increasing the price just because the exchange rate is moving. 
and also price controls. Now, price controls is an interesting one. In Australia, we had a luxury car tax that cut in at about $50,000 those days. So if your car was more than $50,000, that's an additional tax that the government required. So what did Mercedes-Benz, especially the A-Class do? The Mercedes-Benz A-Class advertised the car for $49,990. And when you went to collect the car, there was no radio, pretty poor seats, the cars were very small. So then you say, okay, I'll come back next week, option it up with the good tires, the radios and all of that, and I'll come next week. So they try to bring the price low enough for not to pay the tax. But then after the Austrian dollar collapsed like this, okay, even the Toyotas and Hondas were selling at more than 50,000. The government had no option but to make a luxury car tax cut in at about 65,000. Okay, so you can see the government May this luxury car tax here, okay, had to be changed because of the tip situation we are now. Cars that are not luxury in that case were also in this same category. Okay, so that's the price variation. The other one is the currency invoicing. Now, as you go, Dubai doesn't really matter because you are anyway, in a sense, invoicing everything in US dollars with a straightforward conversion. But in countries that do not have a world, sorry, countries that have a world currency, you can do this. So Australia, Euro, companies, they can do it, but not companies in India or Sri Lanka and so on. The second type of pricing policy techniques of exposure management is the currency invoicing method. This method could be used aggressively or defensively. An aggressive strategy would be to try to invoice imports in relatively weak currencies be it one's own currency or the local country currency. Here, a management accountant would be increasing his or her company's exposure to risk, the expectation that this exposure will produce exchange gains rather than losses. That is the upside. Now, of course, this means an Australian company, we're looking at the Australian, say, US dollar rate, and deciding if to invoice in either one of those currencies. Both are international currencies. A defensive strategy would be to try to invoice all exports and imports in one's own currency. This may be the best method for an exporter whose own currency is strong. Now, of course, recently you heard that China's currency has become an international currency. Okay, so now we can use, China can do this as well. Interestingly, uh, some of you might know this, if you're, if you're working in US dollars, doesn't matter if your transaction is between, say, Pakistan and Iran, if it is in US dollars, the US banks can get involved. Right? So if they don't like the fact that you have sold to Iran okay, or North Korea, they can stop it. They can even take the money and keep it for themselves. Okay, so many countries are trying to avoid that. Now, Sri Lanka, for various reasons, has recognized the Chinese <coughs> driven by as an international currency of trade. Now it doesn't have to go through the US. So if they want, I'm not saying they do it, but if they want, they can sell to Syria and North Korea and Iran. Okay? Without having to go through US banks. So countries are now moving away from the US dollar to these other currencies. Maybe Dubai and UAE may have to do that as well. Okay? Um, rather than stick with the US dollar as its only fixed currency. 